let's get started, you guys. So a uh, couple things that I'm super excited to dig in with today. Let me share my screen. So we're going to talk objections. So we got a framework that we're going to uh, run you through, or Mon's going to run you through today. Uh, it's called the Mr. Miyagi uh, framework. And the goal is that you walk away from today. We're going to put our speakers, our guests on the spot here too. Um, we want you to walk away with a good talk track to handle your most common prospecting objections. So our two guests today, we have Kevin Nguyen, who is a senior sales development representative at Warham. Kevin, good to see you. Good to have you here. And Armand Farouk, founder at 30 Minutes to President's Club, ex-sales leader, sales rep, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, if you're coming onto an Outbound Squad webinar for the first time, my name is Jason Bay. I run Outbound Squad. Uh, we do sales training, coaching, all of that kind of stuff for SDRs and AEs. And before we get started, wanted to thank Aurum uh, for sponsoring. Uh, I couldn't think of a better tool to use for cold calling right now with connect rates being so low. So if you're at an organization where literally three to 5% of the people you call pick up uh, the phone, I would definitely check out Aurum and look into it. One of the my favorite things about Aurum is the virtual sales floor. So if you have a remote team, being able to get people in one place and replicate a sales floor, just having a call center background myself is, is pretty money. So it's 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 really awesome. Um, so let's dig in. So objections. I'll kick the first question your way, Armand. Like in all of your experience, both doing this and then teaching people, where do people tend to go wrong with objections if we start with, hey, what are we trying to accomplish? And before we get into the tactical ways of how to handle them, where do people tend to go wrong with objections? For sure. So for everyone in the audience right now, why don't you go ahead and put the most common objection you receive in the chat? And I think that's going to start to illuminate the answer. So the most common objection you hear on the phones, throw it in the chat right now. Cost, right? No budget. Send me an email. Too expensive. We're all set. We already have a solution. Time. I'm busy. Call me later. I'm in a meeting, right? All of these things are mostly mostly reactions and swats. They're mostly reactions and swats. And so, for example, the natural reaction of a lot of people when they hear, I'm not interested, is they try to pitch value as to all the things I could do for you and why you should be interested. But what you don't realize is the person isn't even listening when they say, I'm in a meeting, they're not in a meeting, or I'm not interested. They're just trying to get off the phone. And so handling the objection the moment you hear it is actually missing a critical middle step in between. And that's what we'll talk about in just a bit with the Mr. Miyagi method. The critical middle step of an objection is you need to take the reaction and blunt the reaction by showing them that you're hearing them out so you can turn a reaction into a conversation and get them talking a little bit more. And then and only then, can you start to introduce some logical sales tactics into the situation? But first they need to feel emotionally heard. And so when you hear I'm not budget and you start to pitch ROI, what you are doing is you're mixing water and oil and you are set up to fail. What you first need to do is receive and feel that objection and redirect the momentum of it before handling the objection. Yeah, and in a way what you're talking about is you know, empathy and, uh an EQ, really. <laughs> it's it's a, it's no different than the reflexive response that you have. It's, it's shopping season. So many of you on this call may have been in a mall or two in the last week or so, or you're about to in the next two or three weeks. I don't know about you guys. When I walk into a store and someone asks, how can I help you? My automatic response is I'm just looking. I literally try not to make eye contact with the sales rep as I'm walking in to just avoid that confrontation. So the EQ piece of, hey, when you say something, when a prospect says something, just showing that you acknowledge it goes a really, really long ways. Um, so Kevin, your perspective on this being an SDR who has, you know, by the way, done extremely well at Orem, especially in the last couple of years. Um, was there a learning curve for you with this? Uh -huh. Like, what was it like getting on the phones the first time and getting an objection and just be like, oh shit, you know, what was it like? So, I mean, to dive back to my background, I started off in retail. Uh, so yeah. 
so you being coming into my store, I was like, yeah, I'm just looking like, hey, no worries. Let me know if you need anything. This is what's on sale right now. This is what's uh, been really popular. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm here to help. My name is Kevin. And taking that, going into retail banking, actually reaching out to my book of business there um, and dodging those objections with those uh, with our current customers, going into staffing, and into B&B, B2B now here. I think that just the adjustment has always been the same. I'm what my purpose is going to the calls. I am trying to help you. I have something that can help you. And I just am here to listen to what's going on uh, and potentially pull out something you may not know is going on. How much of for you with your success do you feel like is like you generally like have belief in the solution that you're selling and that it does help people? How much of of that comes out, would you say, when you're objection handling? Like that conviction, how important is that for you? I think it's. I, I mean, I think it's like half and half, right? Like you have to one, of course, believe the product you're selling. Uh, otherwise, if you're, we use it ourselves uh, on, at Orem. So uh, if I wasn't already using it prior, especially before coming to Orem, I was a customer too. Um, so if I didn't know how well the, the platform worked, I wouldn't be able to, I don't think I'd be able to sell it as well as I do. But being able to help the people I'm reaching out to uh, see the value over a cold call, which is like, hey, I'm actually calling you with Orem right now. I just got off another conversation, booked X amount of meeting, or did this many dials, booked, had many conversations and booked this many meetings. Um, if I could do something for you and your team, would it be worth a longer conversation? Uh, that personal story brings up a lot more uh, when I am, when I get into the weeds, but I have to like get to like everything else first. And that's like probably the back end of my calls. Yeah. So I'm going to drop a pro tip into the chat, drink the company Kool-Aid, whatever you need to do to get to like increase your belief around the outcome is super important. Uh, if you're a sales leader on the call, one of the things that I highly recommend is uh, instead of sharing so many sales wins into the sales Slack channel, share customer wins too. So when a customer gets a really good outcome from the solution that you're selling, share that win into the chat with your sales reps because that instills this belief that we're doing something good. And as a rep, I'm willing to deal with a bit of resistance if I really believe in the solution and want to help the person. Um, Armand, we talked about mirroring. So again, we're going to get into the Mr. Miyagi framework you guys hear in a second and talk tactically how to handle the objections. I think the mindset you bring into it is super important. Um, you talk about mirroring being a common mistake. Talk about that a little bit more because old sales advice would tell you that you need to mirror and match and do all of this other weird stuff, like repeat the last three words back that the prospect says and, and match their tone out. <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about your thoughts there. More about my thoughts there. <laughs> like, like all these like obnoxious voodoo tactics and stuff yeah. like this. Like, don't get me wrong. I actually think, you know, all the stuff that Chris Voss has done is outstanding and yada, yada, yada. And I think it's been a lot of great things for the sales profession, but you got to realize like a lot of times the right thing to do is when a prospect is zigging, you got to zag hard. So if a prospect is coming in hot, I'm going to come in pretty cool and cold, right? My job is to show that I'm not rattled based on their emotional state. Now, I'm not saying go into these calls with zero EQ, right? If someone's talking real slow, don't yap at a million miles per hour, right? But the biggest mistake that people make is the moment someone slams you with a hard objection, they tend to speed up, right? Someone says, I'm in a meeting. You go, oh, can, can I get 30 seconds to tell you why I'm calling? And then, and then, and then you can tell me if it's a fit or not, right? And the moment you speed up and you match their tone, that intensity, that reaction intensity, they know that you are of inferior business stature and that they have been able to rattle you off of your rocker, right? And so instead, what I try to do is I try to blunt the first reaction and give them a response to their objection that they're not expecting. So let's actually segue into part one of the Mr. Miyagi method. Part one of the Mr. Miyagi method is let's use this no budget example, right? What a person is expecting a sales rep to say after I object no budget to you is I'm expecting an ROI pitch in return or I'm expecting an ask for a meeting or I'm expecting for another version of the permission-based opener. And instead, all I'm going to do is agree with that objection heavily. So Jason says, I have no budget. I'm going to say, hey, Jason, this one's totally my bad. I know nowadays 
frankly, it's harder to keep a tool, let alone even asking for a new one. And I'm just going to stop there. The, what do they even do with it? Like, they don't even know what to do with it when you're just agree. Like, they almost want to, like, take their foot off the gas pedal because they don't want to stomp you into the ground. That's step number one. I'll pause right there. Yeah, I'll throw in this. This part's so key. I'll throw in some other, like, words and phrases that I like to use. If you just made a habit out of anytime you get an objection, hey, that's okay. Got it. Or, hey, I hear you. Totally fine. If you met the objection and greeted it, and to use your word, agree with the objection, it has this weird kind of thing where it, it it kind of like almost throws the person off a bit. So it's it's a little different, Luke. You dropped in the chat, you know, AKA or mirror it. We're not trying to mirror the objection. We're trying to acknowledge the objection. So Gong's got a lot of data. I wish I had this this handy around how quickly you talk. What they found is that. Uh, less successful reps in cold calls when they get an objection, they tend to speed up 10, 15, 20 words per minute. So 170 versus 190 words per minute. Top performers literally keep the same pace and tone throughout the entire cold call or sales call, regardless of the objection. So it's not about talking really fast or slow. It's about not deviating from how you would normally interact with a prospect. Um, Joshua asks, doesn't Voss say to use your cool DJ voice when someone is trying to rattle you? I'm confused about that claim. There's no data that supports the tonality. It's also a very hard thing to measure, but the smooth DJ voice, that's not how I normally talk, Armand and Kevin. So if I handle oh, an objection right. like that, you sound like a freaking idiot, dude, when you talk like that. So um, I would focus less on that, the tone of your voice and all that kind of stuff, and greeting the objection. Okay? Um, Armand, let's go through the rest of the framework, and then we'll have some fun with you and Kevin um, here in a second. Uh, yeah. So first is agree. Uh, let's talk about the next couple parts of the Mr. Miyagi framework, and then we'll kind of open it up here. All right. So let's let's go back to the last episode of Dragon Ball Z. So I said, someone said, no budget. In return, what I said is totally get it, yada, yada, yada. You can't even keep a tool, let alone buy a new one. Now the gas is off a little bit. And now what I want to do is I want to incentivize them to share a little bit more about the nature of the objection in a way that it benefits them, not me. So my favorite way to incentivize someone is the number one thing that a prospect doesn't want is a prospect does not want another salesperson to cold call them again. Yeah. Okay. And note that this is different from mirroring. Luke, I see you called that out again. Mirroring would be me saying no budget, which is just like, what am I, a parrot? <laughs> okay. This is hearing what they said and agreeing with it and acknowledging receipt instead of what most salespeople do, which is continuing to barrel through the objection. Okay. So what I'm going to do to incentivize them is I'm just going to say, hey, hey, Jason, just so no one reaches out to you again, could you give me a sense? Is it because yeah. budgeting for this cycle is totally like locked up and you have to wait till 2024? Or is it one of those things where any spending for the next 70 years is totally off limits for the rest of the entire reality we have together? Is it the former or the latter, right? And it doesn't matter what the answer is. Right. It really doesn't matter what the answer is. I'm just trying to incentivize them to start sharing more and get a little bit more comfortable by having a conversation and talking about their objection instead of trying to rip me off the phone. That's number yeah. two. So getting the prospect to share a little bit more. I think that the uh, the toughest part with a cold call is like if I had to use an analogy, a cold call feels more like you're like doing like formula one racing it's extremely fast paced and you got to be really quick on your feet versus a sales call feels more like cruising on the freeway yeah. and you got to be like really quick on your feet and i think one of the hardest things to to do in a cold call is to actually have a conversation because when someone says hello and then you start talking it's not really a conversation yet you're just like talking and they're responding like you aren't like really synced up in a conversation so getting them to share and then why don't you share the last part real quick and then We'll, we'll open this up and kind of go through some different examples here. Sure. So the last part is sell the meeting, not the product, or sell the test drive, not the car. 
a lot of people will get into the ROI claims, the value pitches and all of this stuff, all the things that you could get if you were to buy the product, but they're not there yet. You have to run a five-step sales cycle, a five-stage sales cycle. You're going to have to multi-thread, build a business case, all this different stuff. And that's so far gone. And what they have to do is they have to come up with budget to receive any of that value, right? Instead, what I want to do is I want to offer them something of value that they will get from that 30-minute call that they take with me, even if they do not buy my product at all, right? In other words, there are probably a lot of people in the audience who have test driven a Tesla because it's pretty cool, but you haven't bought a Tesla. There's probably at least one person in the audience who has test driven a Tesla and turned into a buyer of a Tesla who might not have expected to do so. So what I'm going to do to sell the test drive is I'm again going to pile onto the objection more. And I'm going to say, look, Jason, I totally get it. Budgets are locked up for this year. And frankly, most of the time, what this means is like, you're not going to touch anything like this for the next three to six months. Crazy idea for you. Every once in a while, when budgets loosen up, the people who tend to get it are the ones who at least have a one, two, and three on their list of the next best tool they'd want to add to their list. I'm not suggesting you're going to get this now, but would you be completely against taking a look, not for now, but just in case things open up in the next six months? And so what I've done is I've removed the pressure of the sale today. And I've said, hey, if, if you ever get the chance to get more budget, you will lose that chance to get that budget if you don't know what you want to buy next. And so for that reason, why don't you take a look now? So if the opportunity comes up, you can jump on it immediately. I'm giving them a free test drive of the car in case their car breaks down. Got it. Okay. Kevin, before we start to get into some examples, I'm curious, how does this align with your framework? So Armand's Mr. Miyagi approach was agree with the objection, give them in some sort of incentive, which I, I wish that I came up with that because it's genius, right? Because that's what the person really wants. It feels like you're giving them something and then sell the test drive. So sell the meeting, not the solution. You're asking for time. I have some thoughts on that part too. Uh, but before we get to that, Kevin, how do you generally think about the framework that you apply when responding to objections? Yeah, um, I do something very similar. So I also agree with it. If we're gonna stick with budget, it's something that we hit a lot. Uh, I'm always, the first thing I always say is like, yeah, yeah, totally hear you. Budget is something that I come across a lot in my conversations with sales leaders like yourself. Um, understand that want to learn a little bit more about what that budget is and uh, how that's being forward so again incentivizing if it's for this quarter especially where we are right now in the year like are you planning for budget for next year right now has that been finalized or will that be finalized in january of 2024 and then going in for uh the ask just to hey no decision make uh, decision making needed just want you to get want to get you from the platform see it in action um, our demos are super fun because our AEs will do cold calls live on Aurum. And yeah. I'm like, you can roast our AEs if you like. Um, maybe you'll see me on the floor um, while I'm there too, and you can roast me too. Uh, yeah. But if you do like what you see, we can talk about next steps like a free trial. Otherwise, we'll shake hands, follow up when timing's better. How does it sound? Yeah, very similar, almost exactly the same framework. So agree, incentivize, and then you're selling a test drive. You're not trying to get someone to commit to something and making that really. Uh, apparent. So um, let's dig into some responses. I want to answer a couple of questions first. Um, Richard McCoy asked, how do you not five Formula One vibes? I think what he was talking about is referring to how do I get out of Formula One mode and into cruising vibe? Um, <laughs> you're not going to in a cold call. Like the cold call is always going to be very fast paced um, compared to a sales call because you didn't get to prepare for it. It's more like, how do I excel in an environment where it's really, really quick and I have to be very reactive? And the thing that you will have to do is train yourself not to handle the objection right away, to greet the objection. That's how you can slow down the speed a bit. So before we get into specific objections, um, we're going to go through two types of objections, okay? So a lot of you guys dropped in a bunch of examples of objections. There's two types. Um, I, I call these a couple different things, but um, really it's dismissive versus actual objections. There's 
uh, dismissive. I call them instinctual objections. It's the knee jerk reaction, not interested, not right now, about to hop into a meeting, send me an email, take me off your list, et cetera. And then there's the more actual or calculated objections, I call them, where it's a legitimate thing where someone's like, yeah, Kevin, you know, we haven't figured out our 2024 budget yet. It's December. Why don't we talk in uh, Q4 of 2026, you know, <laughs> type of thing. Um, so there's these real objections where the person is like legitimately giving you an answer that they've thought about. Um, let's start first, you guys, with the more dismissive objections. And let's talk about not interested. What I thought that could be kind of fun here is, uh, again, we're going to kind of put our guests on the spot. And you guys could put me on the spot, too, if you want. Um, yeah, we can... Let's talk about not interested. Uh, so if we could first, um, Kevin, you want to be the prospect? Maybe give Armand oh. that objection. Let's uh, let's put Armand on the spot first. Um, and let's pretend that this is this happened in the first 30 to 60 seconds of the call. So what might be kind of interesting, um, Armand, is maybe you do your opener and Kevin, you could kind of cut him off or at the very beginning of the call, say not interested without really even hearing what Armand is calling about. And then Armand, you can kind of talk about, because um, most of the objections, you know, 90% plus of the objections typically happen in the first 80 seconds. So let's talk about that one. Does that work for you too? It's totally. Good. That's fair cool. game. Wait, so I, uh, I'm i going through my opener all the way from the beginning? Yeah, let's start with the opener. And then Kevin, you could, <laughs> I didn't tell LeBron that I was going to do this. Um, and then Kevin, you could maybe totally cut him off or, or, uh, or uh, you know, give him some resistance with the non-interested <laughs> objection at the beginning. And you guys can kind of hear how we might handle it, okay? Oh, man. all right. I, I Just for the record, for folks in the audience, right? This is a live webinar and I was not expecting this. So if I flop, you can post this recording and whatever. Make sure that I never do anything on LinkedIn again. Here we go. Ready? Three, two, one. And a ring ring. Hello, this is Kevin. Hey, Kevin. We uh we work with a couple other sales tech companies here in the Valley. It's uh, Armand from 30MPC. Have you heard her name tossed around? Uh, no, I haven't heard your name toss around, but I'm honestly not interested. Not interested. Do you know what? It sounds like you know what we do. Uh, kind of, sort of, but I don't really have time for this right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, look, I, I know you probably hate receiving cold calls just as much as I hate making them. Just so no one else calls you again, it seems like you're a really busy guy. Um, is it because you, you have a bunch of sponsors in place you're not interested in working with someone like 30 minutes to president's club or you just hate getting cold calls and that's totally fine if it's the third one it's definitely the third one <clears throat> definitely the third one well uh, kevin before you hang up on me can i uh, can i get 27 seconds to tell you what we do and then i can promise you no one will ever cold call you again when you hang up on second 28 yeah let's go for it <laughs> boom <laughs> Bang. Not bad. So what I love about what Kevin did there too is like that was like you emulated what the real experience is like. <laughs> that was not fun. <laughs> that was the real thing. That was me almost all day yesterday. So it's yeah, it's real experience. <laughs> <laughs> um so Armand, you want to unpack what you did there real quick? And I have a version that I like to use to handle this one too. And you guys can you put me on the spot next. Yeah. So I hit him with my opener and uh and it was clear that to Jason's point, like I know this guy knows, has no idea what we're doing, right? And so the tricky thing is Kevin still doesn't even know what I do. So normally what I would do is I would jump to handle the real objection. But in this case, Kevin doesn't even have a real objection. My goal is actually just to get him to let me continue my opener. So I can at least create some degree of a conversation. And so I open, Kevin says, I'm not interested. And I laugh to be a little bit disarmingly blunt. And I basically said, sounds like you know what we do and you're not interested whatsoever, right? He said, uh, sort of yada, 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 right? And then that created an inch of space where I received his objection and basically said like, yeah, it sounds like you know what we do. You're not interested. I was a small agree. And then what I did is I agreed again and pulled more information, throwing some humor in there so that he would really feel like a jerk if he just hung up on me, 
right? And so I was like, is yeah. it because you have sponsorships in place, which is not the right word to use. I shouldn't have said sponsorships, right? Is it because you're not doing any partnerships like this whatsoever? Or is it because you really hate getting cold calls? And that's totally fine if it's the case, right? Kevin says, great, it's number three. And I'm going to keep playing ball and having fun with it at this point, because that's going to make it a little bit harder to hang up on me as opposed to if I just started a rush. And so I agreed with it again and was a little bit cheeky. And I was like, hey, my guess is uh, you like this isn't going to go anywhere just so no one else else ever calls you again can i get a second to tell you what we actually do which is the reason that you said no and then you can hang up on me on the 28th second for example right so it was just like trying to get an inch by inch by inch in every step of the conversation perfect uh cool armand you want to be the prospect i'll cold call you this time I have a right. slightly different way that I handle this, and then we'll hear Kevin's. I think this is a good one to start with because um, let us know in the chat. Just put yes in the chat. How many of you is this the most common thing that you could run across on a cold call is someone saying not interested in the first 60 seconds? Give us a, a yes in the chat if that's the case. Yeah. Okay. 100%. So to give you a little preview of the way that I think of this, my framework is very similar to uh, instead of agree, it's greet. Greet and validate is sort of the first step. And then what I like to do is essentially pressure test if they focus on the same things that their peers focus on. So you're going to hear me refer back to priorities. And then Armand, you know, feel free, obviously, you do, do whatever you want, dude. You are a previous VP of sales, so this is pretty fitting, man. Yeah, um, the problem is I was actually a really nice one because I always tried to give someone the benefit of a doubt on a cold call. So also so they didn't tag me on LinkedIn saying, this asshole talks about cold calling, but doesn't even listen to my cold calls. So I'll, I'll be a little bit more Kevin style on this one. Yeah, cool. All right, ring ring. Hello, who's this? Uh, Armand, it's Jason with Outbound Squad. I know I probably caught you right in the middle of the day. You got a minute for me to show the reason for my call and you can hang up, hang up on me if you'd like. Uh, I, I'm not going to lie, man. I, I, I don't have a ton of time for this kind of thing. No, hey, not a problem. I'll uh, I'll make it quick. I'm I'm curious because I do talk to a lot of VPs of sales like you at you know companies like Medallia, Gong, et cetera. And a really big focus for them is getting their AEs to self-source more pipeline. Is is that by chance something that's that's top of mind for you? Or am I totally barking up the wrong tree here? I, I mean, it always is, but I'm, I'm not big in the sales calls, man, even though I am in sales. You know what I mean? So I I, yeah. I would say for now, not not interested, not a fit. Yeah, totally. Okay. And then we can go wherever we want with the call there. I probably, if the person gave me that resistance again, I might have just like parted ways at that point. Yeah. Um, probably have one more at most. Yeah. So what I want to do there is I want to loop back to what people like them generally care about. And I call this your priority drops. So if I'm reaching out to a VP of sales, I know that generally they want their AEs to self-source more pipeline right now. And multi-threading complex deals is a pretty big focus for the people that I speak with. Um, another big thing would be if I'm, to give you guys a, a more realistic example, because most of you guys are probably not selling to sales executives. Um, another client I work with sells a call center solution and reducing cost to serve is a really big focus for them. To be like, hey, you know, I don't suppose that you're working on something similar that we're hearing other companies like A, B, and C work on, and that you know, reducing cost to serve and and reducing the volume and coming to your contact centers of focus, is it? Cool. So I think the thing that you want to loop in right away is social proof. Like drop in names of other companies that you're working with, and then talk back to the priorities. Um, Kevin, if I can you know, add on that. Oh, if you notice where both Jason and I were taking the objection is because the dismissive part happened so early, both of us were trying to create an inch of space so that we could at least explain either the priority drop, which is Jason's version, or for me, it was a pivot to the permission-based opener to explain what we do, how we help other sales tech companies like Orem, for example. But both of us were trying to create that space so we could at least have some material for the call, right? The way we got there was a little bit different, but that's the same place we ended. Yeah. Following very similar framework too. Uh, Kevin, I'll be the prospect this time. And uh, you play in a world that I'm also very familiar with. So I can uh, I can be a sales executive, let's say. Um, cool. So cool. Ready when you are. Right. Ring, ring. Uh, hello, this is Jason. Hey, Jason. Kevin calling over from Aura. How's it going? Uh, you know, I'm probably not going to be interested, Kevin. Hey, hey, no worries. Didn't expect you to be interested. No, you probably weren't expecting my call either. 
Just want to see if I can take a quick 30 seconds to tell you why I'm calling and you can decide if you want to hang up or not. No, probably not going to be bringing on new solutions or anything like that. So probably, probably not okay. interested for the time being. Totally hear you. A lot of uh, folks like yourself know you're super, probably super busy. A lot of companies uh, in your space aren't really able to take uh, new tools on right now. Curious to know, is it because of budget or are there other priorities in place right now? Cool. Okay. And we'll talk about how to handle that objection specifically later. So very similar type of thing. I think if I had to guess, Kevin, what works pretty well for you too, is your, your tonality is really good, dude. Like it's a very disarming, very easy to talk to you. Um, cool. Let us know in the chat. Is there any other thing that you come across that is similar to not interested? I'm busy. Anything like that? I mean, Jason, the other thing that I like didn't really do and that I'm like looking, listening back on it too, is like, Typically, but when I'm going into these calls, like I have done a good amount of account research, seeing if they're hiring yeah. like that, seeing what their tech stack is. Uh, and like, typically if they're going to give me like, you know, we're probably not a good fit. I'm going to go in there armed with that research. Well, hey, I've done a little bit of research. Saw that your team is currently hiring new reps uh, when you're, they're leveraging outreach or sales loft right now to mm -hmm. try to build pipeline and own, maybe self-source their entire pipeline themselves. So curious to know how has that search been going or what does that mean for 2024? I love that. A big key, Kevin, you shared this before we hit go on the webinar, is as you're listening to us handle objections, the best way to really handle an objection is to customize your response based on intel that you've gathered. So that would be something like if I was using my self-sourcing example, it would be, like, yeah, the reason I was giving you a call, I noticed that you're at about a three to one ratio of SDRs to AEs. And my guess is, that means that your AEs are doing a ton of prospecting right now. So I was reaching out to see if AE self-sourcing is a big priority for you and how you're, how you're handling that right now, right? So being able to have that intel is pretty good. Um, let's talk about the I'm in a meeting right now or I'm about to head into a meeting. And for this part, let's just give the objection to you guys and we can go through the response of it. Um, so let's, uh, let's just do the same thing again. Armand and Kevin, how about, how about you two do it? Armand, you, you could be the rep. Kevin, uh, be the prospect. Let's do the I'm in a meeting or I'm about to head into a meeting and uh, let's go from there. Gotcha. All righty. And a three, two, one, a ring, ring. Uh, hey, I'm on. Uh, how can, so we're already in the call, right? So we're just going straight for yeah, the- Yeah, yeah. Let's just start from okay, the objective. Start yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yep. Yeah, yeah, cool. Cool. Hey, I'm on. Appreciate your call. I'm about to head into a meeting right now. Shoot. Well, Kevin, this one's totally my bad because I called you at one thirty-four, which means I probably made you for your one, late for your one thirty meeting. Question for you: Would you prefer that I called you back at the end of this hour when that meeting is over, so we can have an actual conversation, or can I tell you what I do for thirty seconds just so I don't interrupt you again? I like that. I'm like looking like dumb. I should start using that. <laughs> <laughs> Right at the 30 minute backstop or right now. Yeah. Where do you want to, you know, there you go. Yeah. I guess uh, I get them back more. And, yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So the whole thing is like, I used to handle this one differently where a lot of the people would say, like, I'm in a meeting or uh, I'm about to go into a meeting. And then what I would do is like, I would almost try to play big dog and like call them out or something like that. And so yeah. to a certain extent, I was a little bit cheeky. And I was like, shoot, this one's on me. Like I made you even more late, right? I, I don't want to do this again, right? Do you want me to call you at the backstop when I know your meeting's probably going to end? Or do you want me to give you the 30 second spiel now? I'm going to give you an option, one or the other. And you're probably going to pick one of them. Love it. Kevin. Yeah. You're up, dude. Um, so I can be the prospect this time and give you the right. objection. Um, you know, Kevin, uh, yeah, I'm about to head into a meeting right now. Totally hear you. Sorry for uh, catching you right before the meeting. Uh, to make sure that follow up, don't want to take too much time to make sure the follow up is worth it. Can I just ask you a few questions? Yeah, I'm like super busy. So can you, can you send me an email or? Yeah, I can definitely send you an email. I don't want to get lost in your inbox. Uh, is your team currently uh, leveraging the phones to build pipeline right now? Yeah, they are. Perfect. So this is why exactly why I'm calling. Get into the pitch. Yeah. So I, I think that 
I have a very similar kind of approach to where I will talk about, um, I like the options. Mine is kind of a blend of the two. I like the options that Armand gave. And then Kevin, I, I also like, let me do a tiny bit of when I say discovery, not like you wouldn't discovery call, but let me get a question or two in to decide if it's even worth chasing this person down. Because the reality of the situation is that if you don't get a next step scheduled on that call, the likelihood that you get a hold of them again is extremely low. So there's a couple of things that, um, here, let me give you like an example. Armand, do you want to be the prospect? I'll, I'll kind of walk you through how I would typically handle it. Yep, I gotcha. And a three, two, one. Hey, Jason, uh, totally appreciate the call. I, I'm late for a meeting and I, and I, and I really got a dash right now. Oh, hey, that's okay. It sounds like they're keeping you busy over there, Armand. Um, quick question before I let you go here. Usually when I talk to VPs of sales, like AE self-sourcing is like a really big priority. Is that something you're also focused on or am I totally barking up the wrong tree here? It, it is. I do have to jump to a meeting. So maybe you can like send me some information or something like that. Um, But I guess that's always what we're focused on. You know what I mean? Sorry, I just got to- Totally. I, no, totally. How about I send you a calendar invite for five minutes tomorrow? Same time, I'll send an email on the way there too. If, if you like what you see in the email, you accept it. We chat real quick. And if you don't, you decline it. How's that sound? That's 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 fair. Sure. I got to go, but okay. okay, that's fine. I like that. That's good. Uh, um, can I share what I heard or what I felt as a prospect for a second? Sure, yeah. So what I felt as a prospect is I was like trying to play the position of the rushed person. And like when Jason asked for... You know, you asked me that pipeline self-source question. I was still rushed and I was like ready to go. And then I hit him with, send me some information. And the first half of his response, I'm like, Ugh. but then the way he ended it, he was like, I'll send a calendar invite. And I was like, Ugh. and then he was like, and I'll send you some information. And if you don't like what you see, you can decline it. And I was like, okay, I feel like I have some control here. And now this is actually a forcing function for me to take a look. I thought that was really, really freaking good. The way you gave me control while still keeping control of the next step. Yes. Number one rule in sales is don't leave a call without a next step. And I think that we only talked about how that applies to a sales call. That applies to a cold call too. If you don't get something on the calendar, I, I wish I had better data on this because it's just like varies across companies. But I would love to see what the macro data looks like of if I end a call without something on the calendar, what is the likelihood that that person even picks up the next time I call them? So we're just playing the odds here. When someone asks you to send an email or call them back or whatever it may be, if you don't get something on the calendar, it's like probably less than a 1% chance that you're going to get a hold of them again and schedule something. Yep. Like take, take the risk on the call to get something scheduled. Agreed. You will be part uh, of the protection program your prospects will be part of the witness protection program if you say i'll call you back later your phone number will yeah. be forever blackballed and they will never pick up again yeah so um i'm just looking at the chat here yes everyone will get a recording you guys afterwards so you'll get you'll get a play-by-play -play of this let's let's talk about the last objection we'll spend some time on with the instinctive category the dismissive category send me an email um, I think this is probably the one that gives people the the most grief. And I think we have a couple of different styles that we like to use uh, for handling this one. Um, let's, uh, I'll put myself in the hot seat first uh, for this one. Um, Kevin, you want to be the prospect? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so what I'm about to do, just so you guys can kind of listen, is uh, you want to comply with their ask. So I'm going to agree with the ask. I'm going to meet it. I'm going to greet it, et cetera. Um, and then ultimately, I know that if I leave this call and I just send an email, there's a very low chance. And let me know if anyone has experienced anything different that I send them an email that's so good that Kevin's like, oh my God, this is exactly what we've been looking for. Can you meet right now? Like, that's just not going to happen when you send an email. So I want to get some more info and then I'm going to ask for the meeting again. Um, Kevin, go ahead. Hey, Jason, appreciate the call. Kind of super busy right now with other priorities. Can you just send me an email? Oh, hey, sure. Totally, Kevin. Um, so I can get the right info to you. Typically, when I'm speaking with contact center leaders, their number one focus is reducing cost to serve, specifically by just reducing the amount of customers that call in with questions that could have been self-served. Self uh, how does that compare to like what you're working on at ABC Company with your, com 
uh, with your team right now? Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. Um, is there a, a focus in particular to reduce the amount of incoming call center volume? I and mean, the reason I ask that is most of the stuff I would send you an email is super generic. And I want to make sure it's actually helpful. Is, is that actually something that you're focused on right now? Or it's okay if you're not? Uh, it's not nothing, nothing we're focused on, but I really got to go. Can you just send me that email? Yeah, totally. Um, last real quick, Kevin, before I go, I wouldn't be doing my job unless I asked. I, again, most of the stuff I would send you is pretty generic. We've actually helped similar companies like you know Nordstrom and a few others uh, with a very similar problem. Um, do you have your calendar handy? We maybe put 10 or 15 minutes on, on the calendar tomorrow, walk you through it, and then we part ways as friends if it's, for whatever reason, not a good fit. How's that sound? Yeah, let's let's just do that then. And that's probably the way he responded. I, that's probably a pretty low percentage chance that that person shows up to that meeting. Um, and I want to at least get to that point to where if if Kevin is not focused on the stuff that I normally help with, do I even want to meet with him? That's the question that you got to ask yourself. Yeah. So I think there, ask for the meeting. If, if Kevin shared a little bit more and I was able to get a little more intel from him, I can use that as the reason for the meeting. But I think social proof and insight and what you can share around how their peers are tackling a similar challenge, like make that the reason for the meeting. If you guys ever play the video games where like you have to like tap the A button to like fill up a bar and then like you have to press B to like launch the thing, right? Like that's that's a little bit what like cold calling can be like. And I think Jason's call just there was a really good example of it. Like is if you just keep tapping A, like eventually like it's going to just like explode on the table and you won't even get to launch it. And you have to jump off the cold call and make your ass for the meeting at the point where you give yourself the highest odds of at least getting a meeting on the calendar, right? And so in that case, to Jason's point, that meeting is probably like a one in four chance that like Kevin even says yes in that case. But like, that's the best you're going to get on a cold call like that. And three out of four times, they're going to say no. But if you can get yourself, if you can buy enough enough yourself enough time to get to that point where you can click B, one in four times, you will get one in four of those meetings, knowing that the best cold callers in the world book one in four connects, right? So you're still winning when you're playing those odds. That's important to understand. The goal with objection analysis is not like it does not, nothing is so foolproof that it works every time. We're just right. trying to increase the odds. It's already hard enough to freaking get the person on the phone, unless you're using Orem, which I definitely recommend you check out. <laughs> Little plug. Um, so Armand, Let's uh let's say if you go next. Cool. I think awesome. you have a do you have a disarmingly blunt approach to this objection? There's one path of the tree that will lead to it. And I'm hoping Kevin leads me there, or you lead me there, whoever's the prospect. Okay. Kevin, you All be right. the prospect. You're you're the best at at, at being like the rude prospect. Kevin is just a savage prospect. <laughs> you can tell Kevin's been cold calling in the real game. I'm a softball. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday was a really hard day for me. Okay. I, I did not feel good. <laughs> um, All right. Go ahead, guys. Hey, Armand, appreciate the call. Uh, can you just send me an email and take a look at it to see if it's a fit? Totally. And let's say I'm playing Orem. Hey, Kevin, and just so I don't clutter your inbox with the wrong thing of information you already know, could you give me a sense of, sense of like, to, to what extent do you know what we do over at Orem? Because I can send you something generic that's an overview, or I can send you something specific if you know what we do. Uh, uh, all I know is that you're an auto dialer. Phones haven't been very strong for us in the past. Phones haven't been very strong for you in the past. Is that right? Yeah. Gotcha. That totally makes sense for me. Y you know, Kevin, in, in this case, my guess is like sending you some information. If you're feeling like phones aren't, haven't been very effective for you in the past it's probably like not gonna help because we allow your team to be more efficient on the phones um could i get a sense from you just out of curiosity like why is it that phones haven't been efficient in the past is it that your reps don't like to dial is that you don't connect is it something else uh, it's a combination of the of the both we target it so not a lot of people are picking up <clears throat> and then the yeah. reps don't like feeling like they're not they're wasting their time yeah, whenever my laptop is broken, my IT person doesn't pick up either. And it's like, I'm an internal employee, let alone an external one. So I, I could totally see how that would happen. Um, look, Kevin, my, my guess is you're probably not going to buy this thing or even like want to take a call. But 
I have a thought. Like usually what I see is the reason that teams are ineffective on the phones is because the reps don't want a cold call because you connect with like 3% of people. And like, I can give you a generic overview of Orem, but we let you cold call like up to 10 people at the same time. So you can have 10x the conversations that you'd normally have in an hour. Can I send you a quick video on how it works and attach a calendar invite to it? And if you don't like what you see inside of it, you can decline the invite. Yeah, sounds good. Cool. Um, and so if Kevin said no, the disarmingly blunt version, or if Kevin was like, no, 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 send me some email, send me some information, decline the calendar invite, I would have been like, hey, Kevin, can I ask you an honest question? And I would say, Kevin, honestly, like most of the time when people tell me they just want to send me some information, it just means they're they're too nice to tell me to go away. Is that what's happening here? Or do you actually want me to send you some information? And that's like the disarmingly blunt final resort of an answer. Yeah, I love that. Pro tip, you did this, I've heard it called a negative reversal, uh, but you you used language that was unassuming. So you said, hey, you're probably not even going to be interested in checking this out. When you say stuff like that, you're you're making it easier for me to say that I'm interested because I I, I feel like I don't have to disagree with you. Like I can agree with you. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it's oh. it's really interesting. Um, so that negative reversal is a really good tool to use, you guys. Hey, this 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 is probably not even a fit for you. I, I don't even know, but here's what we could do. And the way that you asked for that, I I love this. I can't remember who I even learned this from, but dude, the pro move of sending the invite and saying you can cancel it, it's just so hard. I think it's so easy to say yes to that. It feels really low commitment because Think about the, guys, you got to really think about the calendar of your executive. Dude, most people can barely find 30 minutes in their calendar for their internal team to meet with them. And you're asking for 30 minutes. It's a huge commitment. Because most of the time, 58% of the time is what the data shows us is that the buyer feels like they wasted their time on that call. So six out of 10 times, people feel like it's going to be a waste of their time. So just something to think about. Um, Kevin, do you have a different way of handling this objection? Uh, I feel like I do a combination of the both. It also like depends on who I'm talking to. So first agreeing, like happy to send you the email. When I spoke, if it's like a, I've been going after low uh, previous accounts that I've been working for a long time. So it's just yeah. like, I talked to XYZ before this was a previous uh, initiative that y'all had. Uh, is this still the case? If so I can send uh, specific information here. Um, or I just be like, don't want to send it, don't want to clutter your inbox. Um, saw that your team is currently doing this, uh, and we help people doing this. Would this be more relevant to see live on a call? If not, happy to send you that email. Yeah, very similar. Cool. <laughs> just for time's sake, let's go to the next one. I think we should tackle budget next. And Kevin, we can we can go with you first on this one. Um, let us know how many of you are, give us a yes in the chat. How many of you are getting some variation of we don't have budget or budget's not set yet? We're not bringing on any new solutions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, cool. You ready, Kevin? I'll be the prospect. All right, cool. <clears throat> um, yeah, Kevin, you know, Orem sounds great, but <laughs> dude, we just don't have the budget right now. You know, we're, we're, we're not hiring any more reps right now. We're, we're sort of on a hiring fees, but uh, budget's, budget's pretty tight. Hey, Jason, thank you for the transparency. Really appreciate the information. Understand that budget's tight right now. It's something I'm coming across in my uh, daily conversation with other sales leaders. Um, given that you don't have any budget, what would it hurt to just take a look at the platform live? You can see it in action. Um, we can You can roast my AEs. You may even roast me on a call if I'm on the floor. Uh, and you can really get a sense of what we do and have an understanding of what this could look like in the future when budget does come uh, available. Uh, if you do like what you see, we do offer a free trial after that to really prove our ROI. And those meetings you book on that trial are free on us. If, if it doesn't work out, no worries, water under the bridge. Um, and we'll swap all up when time is right. That being said, do you have time next week? Yeah. So very similar to what Armand had showed before around the test drive. You sell the test drive. Um, Armand, since you already did this one earlier, I have a very different take on this one. Um, so with budget, uh, go ahead, Armand. Were you going to say something? No, I was just doing this. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, with budget, 
I want you to think about your value prop, you guys, and think about what value prop ties into cost savings or removing unnecessary spend, okay? So I'll give you an example. Um, this is the one we can role play, Armand, if you want to be the prospect. Uh, let's say that you're an HR, you know, a VP of HR, okay? okay. Um, and I'll use an example from a, from a client. So what you guys want to think about is what parts of your value prop and your value drivers tie to inefficiency, okay? Uh, go ahead, Armand. Hey, Jason, I, I really appreciate the call, but like you've probably heard this with HR teams. We're just getting slammed with any sort of spending right now and like all spending is on hold whatsoever. No, totally. And uh, Armand, I'm hearing that from a lot of HR leaders. That That's actually the reason I was giving you a call. I noticed that you guys are using X, Y, and Z solution right now for it looks like hiring, applicant tracking, and benefits and that sort of stuff. Oftentimes when I'm speaking with HR leaders right now, they're looking to reduce the number of tools in their tech stack for cost savings. Does that sound a lot like what you're thinking about right now? Will it be cheaper? <laughs> you know, I'm not really sure uh, how to, you know, because I don't know what you're spending on your tools right now, but looking for these inefficiencies that are created for their team through manual tasks and just the unnecessary spending of these tools, I could show you how we're helping, you know, companies like your, your gongs and your Zooms of the world reduce some of that complexity and there likely would be some cost savings. Do you have your calendar handy? I'd be interested in taking a look. Yeah, because it's actually valuable. <laughs> like I'm like, oh, if you could consolidate tools and spend, that agrees with my objection. So if you guys have, uh, if your tool consolidates, that's a really great one. If I'm selling Orem, I would think of it a little differently. Like it's the efficiency. So like if I was, if I got that objection with Orem, I might, and Kevin, by the way, is the pro. He actually does this every day for Orem. I don't. So take what I say with a grain of salt. This is just an idea. <laughs> Um, I might say something like, you know, hey, Kevin, I'm, you know, I'm hearing that from a lot of sales leaders right now. You know, a lot of sales, sales leaders are dealing with tight budgets. They're not really doing any hiring. And the number one thing we hear is how do I take our existing reps and get more out of them with our technology so we have better utilization and we can avoid, you know, the massive time and budget that it takes to hire new reps? Does that at all sound like something you're thinking about and focused on right now? And usually the answer is you want the answer to that question to be yes. You want to ask it in a way where it's like, yeah, we are thinking about that. Well, that's exactly what we're helping companies like X, Y, and Z with. They're not hiring right now. They're looking, how can I increase the efficiency two, three times of each rep and hit our number without having to hire people? I want to share how those companies are doing that. Do you have your calendar handy? So if you can work in some sort of efficiency gain with existing staff or talk to the real objection that the prospect has, I mean, that's a really good way to handle the budget yeah. objection. Yeah. Um, I do just, like, it also depends like who I'm talking to as well. Uh, yeah. with, if I'm talking like uh, on the ground managers, then that's maybe not be something that I do. I'll actually try to talk about uh, like they're like, they're a little bit self-conscious because they don't want to bring up something that could have, that maybe affect their position with the team. Yeah. I'm talking to like maybe VP of sales or uh, VP of sales off and talking like, Hey, We've helped teams like Data Rails, who have a team of four, actually increase their productivity and saw a daily increase of 24% of SQLs. We could do something similar yeah. for you with your team, maybe with long conversation. Love it. Let's go through one more. Um, we already have a solution. Okay? Yep. We'll start with Yorimon. How do you kind of think about this one when someone's using a competing solution uh, or they're using something that's like they already have a solution in place. It doesn't need to be a direct competitor, uh, so to speak. It could be piecing together other stuff, doing it manually, whatever it might be. Um, how do you think about this one? And then we'll we'll do it real quick. Yeah, so this one is um, the critical part of this one is the incentivize them to share more information because there's a double tactic inside of it, right? So if they're on a competitor, the number one thing that I can recommend for you all is you don't have to memorize every competitor. You don't have to memorize every single battle card but you do have to memorize one dart per competitor, okay? One dart will make your incentive much more valuable. So I'll just like talk this through. When I used to work at PAVE, there were some competitors where we would quote 50 grand and the competitors would be quoting 15. And a lot of people were on those legacy solutions and those legacy solutions would let those companies plan all of their salary compensation every year, but they would not be able to handle equity compensation. 
And so what I'm going to do when I hear that is I'm going to agree with the objection. I'm going to say, hey, Jason, totally get it. My guess is you're probably not going to switch off of open comp anytime soon. Nine times out of 10, it does not make sense to switch off of open comp. Um, just before I let you go, out, out of curiosity, are, are you using open comp to plan all of your equity comp planning too? Or is that something that you're handling offline? And so I'm going to ask a dart in the one area that I know that competitor does not succeed. And then I'm going to push on it more. And I'm just going to say, hey, even so, I don't know if you're going to buy this thing. But if nothing else, you'll get a quote to keep these guys honest. And you'll get a sense of like how we help with equity comp as well as like a couple other reasons people have switched to us. Would you be completely against taking a test drive? Not for now, but maybe for your upcoming renewal whenever the open comp contract is up. And so I'm using the dart to your point, James, as a trap question to expose one hole. And then I'm going to say other customers have switched, right? But again, I don't know if that's going to be the case for you, but don't you want to know? Like, don't you want to know if you're like the two in 10 where it does make sense to switch off? And then I'll sell the rest of the ship when they're actually on that call. So this is like where you have to really be a trusted advisor. And part of being a trusted advisor is you know the competitive landscape. You know exactly which holes your solution fills that they aren't able to, and you're able to ask specific pointing questions around that. That's like the that's like the 300 level version. I feel like of this how to handle this objection, uh, Kevin. Just because we got a couple more minutes left, how do you think about this objection? Someone's already got a solution in place, and uh, yeah, let's just start with that. How do you think? Yeah. About that? I always am trying to learn about what their experience with that solution is and what it is first and foremost, right? Like glad to hear you have a glad you have your a solution in place. Curious to know what it is and how have your experience been going with it. And like just trying to get them to talk a little bit more about it before even pulling in a dart um and saying something that I know about it. So the discovery piece, um I think it's really big. The tonality in greeting the objection is really key in getting them to open up and share more, in my experience. Um, mm -hmm. I'll share one other thing, and then we got to gotta bounce, is I love pros and cons. So if you can say, hey, sounds great, Kevin. Like, sounds like you're totally taking care of it. I am curious. What we oftentimes hear from sales leaders is that when they're using this solution, what they really like is this thing. And what they don't like for a Mons framework is I'm going to point out something that is a pain point for them. What's your experience, Pat? And oftentimes you can get them to start like talking about things that they don't like about the solution. Um, holy shit, you guys, that was uh, like my brain is like pretty taxed right now. I, I don't know about you guys. Um, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> so, I didn't realize it was going to be a 15 minute webinar and a 45 minute cold calling session. <laughs> Jeez. Next time I'm going to yeah. ask before you ask me to get on one of these. This is great. Yeah. Okay. We got two things. I want to thank everyone. Um, we are running a special right now with outbound sprint, I dropped it into the chat. So we're giving a hundred dollars off uh, through the end of December. So if you want help putting some of this stuff into action, it's live workshops. There's a course. We teach everything from objection handling to cold email to cold calling, et cetera. Uh, go check that out and then go make sure to check out Orem and go check out 30 NPC. Let me drop that into the chat as well. And I want to thank everyone for their time. Armand, Kevin, thanks you too for coming on and and uh, being troopers here and and let me put you on the spot and uh, thanks everyone else for the engagement and that's all i uh that's all i got for you guys we'll see you have a good one thank you everyone peace, peace.